No, this is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, okay. political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hey, everybody. Just want to announce that we had a Human Action Podcast raffle, which gives the winner attendance to the Human Action Conference. And that wrapped up, and the winner was Philip Boggs. So congratulations, Philip, and we will reach out to you so you can claim your prize. Nick, welcome to the Human Action Podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, glad that we're talking. I uh, appreciate your, uh, you know, I guess this all generated from a, uh, a Twitter, uh, you know, exchange from a while ago. And uh, I'm happy to talk, talk to you and talk about optimism versus pessimism, long term, mid term and short term and, uh, you know, how it intersects with libertarian ideas. Yeah, same, same here. And yeah, I am glad that we were able to do this instead of it merely being an online squabble. So yeah, the let me just give the quick backstory, Nick, because we don't do like pre-recorded intros for these episodes. So yeah. folks, Nick, um, what are you, an editor at large? Is that your title? I am editor at large, yes, for okay. that reason. All right. And uh, so he's been around. He's sometimes known as the Fonzie of yes, libertarianism. Right. Um, yeah. So... Nick had, I, I had been talking with various people and they're lamenting the, you know, the, the fate of our country and, you know, mm -hmm. it's woes and so forth. And look at, here we are living through a collapsing empire. And yeah. then I saw a tweet where Nick, I, I mean, when I hand the reins over to you, if you want to explain where you were, mm -hmm. but you were given an interview or something and you were making the case for optimism. And it wasn't just that you were optimistic, but you said something like, you know, there's never been a better time to be alive, and I think that I the, it is a great time yes. to be alive. And, the, and, there's, and you, in this much. particular, the thing that triggered me was you said there was. Um, it was a good thing I was in a safe space at the time. <laughs> you said there was a like an, you, you were you were lamenting the the misguided pessimism or unfounded pessimism. I forget what adjective it was, but it was definitely something you didn't endorse among libertarians. Okay, so yeah, so the, I responded to that, and then mm. so I had written yes, I had written something. And, and, you know, and then we were going yep. back and forth. And so I thought, okay, why don't I, you know, Nick, do you want to talk about it? And so that's mm -hmm. why you're here. And then folks, Nick and I both agreed, we don't want this to be a debate. We want it to be a discussion. Yep. However, I think it'll make more sense because, you know, you and I kind of exchange volleys in the written, well, mm -hmm. I wrote a thing up in response. Yeah, yeah, which so, I've read. Uh, and we agreed. So maybe I'll literally just keep a watch, just, you know, to make sure I don't go over but if we, I thought we would each take, if you want to give like a five minute ish. I'll, I'm going to try to pitch. do like three to five okay. minutes. You know, my, my uh, basic, and I'm already running out the clock here, but you know, if a, a song like the Beatles, uh, you know, like, you know, Hey Jude or something, or I you're gonna uh, say it's getting better. A, a day in the life. No, it's like, you know, three or four minutes. Uh -huh. Like I should be able to kind of, you know, like, you know, I, I should be able to do this pretty quickly. I was speaking at the Students for Liberty uh, annual event called LibertyCon, and I forget exactly what panel or whatever I was on, but um, part of it had to do with, um, you know, what's going on in the libertarian movement and uh, whatnot. So what I was saying is that it's a fantastic time to be alive um, and that it's, it's a good time for human freedom and human flourishing. And I believe that. And the way that I think about this and is that, I was born in 1963. Uh, my father was born in 1923, and I, my older son was born. You know, so my father was born 40 years before me. My oldest son, uh, older son, was born uh, 30 years after me in 1992. So, like, one of the ways that I think about are things getting better or worse is I just peg it to the world my father was born into, the one I was born into, and the one that my older son was born into, just on a very basic level. And what I would submit. This is, you know, the main reason why I think about um, things getting better um, is when my father was born in 1923, life expectancy at birth, according to Social Security, um, you know, and we, we are both against mandatory Social Security, I think. So, you know, there's a lot of agreement here um, already, but in 1923, it was basically 63 years. Uh, when I was born, 40 years later, it had gone up to 74.4 when my son was born in 92, it was 79.2. And if you run it up to 2022, just for the hell of it, it's uh, 82 years, basically. 
per capita GDP was about $7,000 when my father was born. It was 20,000 or 2,100, 21,000 when I was born. It's about 40,000 when my son was born, and now it's 62,000, 63,000 roughly. Uh, if you look at things like work hours, like just a lot of indicators of material progress. Uh, people are living longer, they are healthier, they're wealthier, et cetera. So, you know, in that sense, that's, you know, that's a rough starting point. We're better off than we used to be materially. I'll also point out um, uh, Brookings Institution using uh, World Health Organization data in uh, the mid-teens, and they've kind of updated it. COVID is a little bit of a screwball in all this, but not much. Uh, they found that for the first time, uh, like around 2017, for the first time in human history, a majority of people on the planet were living at or above a middle class income. You know, we talk a lot about how extreme poverty, uh, which can be defined in various ways, uh, has declined very rapidly over the past 30 years. But what's even more amazing than that is that most people on the planet now are living at a middle class or above lifestyle when you, you know, take into account local purchasing power. So that's a cause for optimism. And that, that does mean it's better to be alive now than to be alive 50 years ago or 100 years ago, I think. I would argue, and this is where I think we'll have more disagreement, culturally and morally, we're also better off. And by that, what I mean is that culturally, I, you know, I, I have a PhD in American literature. I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of uh, creative expression, you know, art, music, video, movies, literature, and things like that. Just, you know, compared to when I was a kid, like we're so much better off. The, the cost to produce and consume creative expression have dropped on a zero. Um, you know, it's, it's just every, everything, there is so much more available. All of the best stuff that has ever been, uh, you know, written and said uh, is available. Plus, we can produce our own and we remix it in all sorts of unauthorized ways. We live in a world of permissionless innovation, uh, certainly in the cultural arena. We need to do better in the economic arena. But even there, creative destruction, destruction is still really huge. And I would also say we're morally better off. I think about this when my, you know, my parents got married. Uh, they were the children of immigrants. My father was Irish. My mother was Italian. Uh, they got married in 1950. My father's family didn't talk to my mother for a year or so because she was Italian. You know, even though they were both Catholic, uh, and uh, you know, it was like, wow. That, you know, when I was born in '63. It was something like under 5% of Americans thought interracial marriages were moral. Mm -hmm. uh, it took until the mid-80s before you got a, a simple majority saying that. I think, you know, morally now we live in a world where we don't think about things like that. That's reduced to the ash heaps of history. Gay people can get married. Gay people can be accepted. We are across a wide variety of, of personal indicators, which are very important to me as an individualist and as a libertarian. We can more live our lives the way we want to. Uh, and that's true for more people than ever before, I think. Um, we're also less violent as a society. Uh, we're less sexist. We're less racist. Um, we have a better attitude towards, um, I think, intoxicants and whatnot. You know, one of the things that is great, and I'm not saying this to endorse drug use, but the wind down of the drug war, which is beginning, is a very important thing, not simply from human flourishing, but from a specifically libertarian angle, because it's saying that, you know, nobody has a right to tell you what you can and cannot put into your body. You live with the consequences, of course, but we're, we're in, you know, certainly in our lifetimes, I think, um, you know, we're at the best point, you know, for that kind of thing. So across these broad areas of uh, human activity, human expression, human flourishing, we're doing extremely well. None of this is to say that we don't have like massive and, and in many cases growing problems to deal with. Uh, you and I both are deeply concerned about things like national debt. Um, you know, in the national debt, the entitlement state, the surveillance state, all of these things are large and in many ways growing. Uh, you know, certainly debt is certainly surveillance, although I think there's workarounds and things like that. Um, you know, so there's many, many problems ahead. But what I was saying in that comment and what I think is broadly true, and I think is true not just from a, a kind of, okay, you know, human beings are doing well, but from a specifically libertarian angle, we live in a profoundly libertarian world 
if you define libertarianism not in a very kind of narrow, uh, uh, you know, kind of doctrinaire way of saying, okay, if government is growing, then everything else is, is, is shrinking, but rather from the idea of like, as an individual, do you have more ability to live the life that you want to live uh, peacefully and openly and honestly and in, in the light of day? I think things are going extremely well. That's what I meant. Okay, great. I think that was closer to a Don McLean length song than a Beatles one. Just so I, you know. Don McLean is a real downer. <laughs> uh, you know, I highly recommend anybody read the or listen to the American Pie album, any of his albums. He, it's amazing. He, I think he died recently, but like how he didn't commit suicide is is a mystery. Yeah, well, his, yeah, his Vincent is very poignant. Um, yeah. Okay, so let so again, folks, we're, we're, Nick and I are going to have just a, a friendly conversation, but let me just to throw a bunch of stuff yeah. out just to set the table and I'll set my, for, I'll try to keep it to five. So yeah. And, and you anticipated some of these, uh, let me just cl clarify at the outset, I'm going to narrowly focus on the United States. I agree. Yep. Um, if someone wants to make the case that, you know, the air, the randomly selected earthling is better off now than yep. 20 years ago, or the prospects look good. That's why. And also too, I should clarify even there, the way I just framed it, I am not denying necessarily that, someone today or more like somebody who was born within the last 10 years is better off than somebody who was born 50 years ago. People can quibble, but I'm more specifically arguing with how you said, like, because it's like right now is the best time ever. I think in other okay. words, on several of the dimensions you mentioned, the U S specifically peaked a while ago and now is in, in the decline. So okay. I'm just, and I'll just run through some of these. So and, the yeah. debt and, and, and part of this too, was just so people realize like how bad certain things are in case they haven't been totally keeping so, for example, the, the federal spending debt situation, the latest CBO report says the, you know, the U.S. deficit is going to be about $1.6 trillion this year, and it will never be lower than that ever again. Right. Which, you know, <laughs> it's not just like, oh, yeah, there's a, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a rough spot because of COVID or whatever, but we're going to grow out no, of it. No. Like, you know, so there's yeah, that I mean, element. It's classic Bob Higgs uh, crisis on Leviathan, yeah. spending jacked up during COVID, and it came down a little bit, but it's never going back down to pre-COVID levels. We've got, uh, one of my favorite go-to is, there was a New York Times story, I think in 2012, talking about how the president has a secret kill list. And that's not mm -hmm. me putting words in there. Yep. That was literally the copy and how President yep. Obama at the time and his advisors would get together. They'd have PowerPoint presentations about who should we send flying killer robots to take out, drones. Mm -hmm. And... They were concerned, and, and some of them could be U.S. citizens, and they could be on foreign soil in a, in a nation where we weren't right. at war with them, and still they had determined, no, we can go ahead and send a drone and kill them. And there was concerns about due process, but they said, no, they don't need a trial, or we don't need a judge to sign off on it, because right. we discussed it internally. That's the, that's their due process, you know? Yeah. And you know, there, we weighed the pros and cons of killing them. So there's, there's that element. Um, you know, James Clapper famously told Congress, no, we're not doing mass surveillance, you know, collecting information on phone calls and such on Americans on a mass scale, you know, maybe inadvertently, you know, leading us to believe yeah. the FBI is, you know, following some terrorists or whatever. And then if they order a pizza that maybe the innocent pizza guy gets pulled into the, but no, then of course Snowden comes out and shows he was just lying through his teeth. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that he was lying, but nothing happened to him. <laughs> right. Like right. He's, he's still, you know, he didn't get prosecuted oh, for yeah. that. Um, Maybe not as big deal to people who don't who hate Donald Trump's guts, but this thing about the uh, the recent the New York uh, civil fraud verdict there, just to make sure people understand what's going on. So there, you know, the allegation. Well, he was convicted. The, the the crime, according to New York State, is that Trump engaged in fraud, um, inflating the values of a lot of his properties when applying for loans uh, from Deutsche Bank for uh, a specific example, and that. You know, this is hurting Deutsche Bank because they could have charged a higher interest rate had they not been defrauded by Trump's claims and inflating his property. And the particular statute that they used is one that has never been used in this way before. It's typically been used like uh, if if there's a like class action suit where so people getting, you know, innocent people or old ladies getting defrauded, slick companies coming in and the consumer doesn't really know what they're doing. And there's actual damages, you know, like the, the consumers got ripped off. And then, you know, the attorney general of New York will prosecute some company on their behalf. Whereas in here, the reason the Trump defenders are calling it a victimless crime is because they paid the loans back with interest. You know, they didn't they didn't default on the loan. 
Deutsche Bank's employees themselves testified in Trump's behalf at the trial saying, we're fine with this. This is cool. We did our due diligence. You know, uh, this happens all the time in these markets where the, you know, the promoter is real optimistic and puts a rosy estimate on the value of their property. And in several cases, Trump gave us a number, what he thought he was worth, and we we wrote it down. You know, that's that's how this works. What are you talking about? And it's not just because they like Trump, but it's it's a chilling effect, you know, that now investors aren't so willing to go into New York State because they're worried, like, this is kind of a wild card. In other words, you could do a deal, you're happy, the bank's happy, everybody's happy, and if the attorney general comes in and says, no, we don't like the valuations you gave on your, you know, even though there's disclaimers and stuff. So, you know, just, again, just to show how politicized things are. And then the last thing I'll say here, and then we can just flip it over to the conversation, is yes, in terms of like life expectancy, where, but actually that that peaked in his turn. So this is from Wikipedia. Uh, from 2000 to 2020, more than 800,000 people died by suicide in the U.S., blah, blah, blah. In 2022, a record high, 49,500 people died by suicide. And that was the highest rate since 1941 at 14.3 per 100,000. Surging death rates from suicide, drug overdoses, and alcoholism, what research referred to as deaths of despair, are largely responsible. For a consecutive three-year decline of life expectancy in the U.S., this constitutes the first three-year drop in life expectancy in the U.S. since the years 1915 through 1918. Okay, so um, maybe one last thing I'll say, Nick, too, is on yeah, the, yeah. you know, the the uh, you know racial relation. I would argue that yeah, you were mentioning like so certainly added like racism clearly was better in the 1980s than in the 1950s. But I think it it you know troughed and then is an increase. So I think now people are much more conscious about race. And in fact, interracial dating is not universally accepted, but it's the other way around that there's, you know, it's well known that like, you know, black women get mad at black athletes for dating white women, you know, and that's relatively benign, I suppose. But no, it, it's clear that white heterosexual males are not, uh, you know, popular people in terms of U.S. culture in, in many venues and settings. And so, uh, I think, and that, and and that has bred, you know, more resentment. Like, like people, there's far more open support for Adolf Hitler now than I've ever seen in my lifetime. And, you know, that has a lot to do with October seventh and everything like that. Yeah. But, but I'm just saying, I don't like these general trends that you're talking about. I agree, were true for large stretches, you know, going back. Hmm. But I actually think things have been getting worse in the last ten years. Let's say, so I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. I mean, you know, I, I think, uh, well, a, a couple of specific things. One, you know, I completely agree with you about, you know, the size of the national debt and the growth of government. The, these are issues. And, you know, whether you want to uh, talk about somebody like Mansur Olson, you know, uh, an older uh, kind of theorist of why governments, you know, kind of keep growing until, you know, they effectively kind of uh, uh, collapse under the weight of their own kind of concretization and ossification and things. Or somebody more recent like um, uh, Jonathan Rausch, who I guess now it's almost 20 years ago, talked about what he, he called, I think, demosclerosis. Um, you know, there's something in that, um, you know, that there's, you know, clearly something is wrong in the governance of a lot of what Donald Rumsfeld, who I am rarely quoting in a positive way, but called old Europe, um, you know, there's there's something wrong in that, and there's a certain dimension to which America is becoming more like Europe, where it's just having a large kind of bureaucratic state that continues to ooze and grow and kind of try and screw things up or get in the way of everything. You know, and I think, um, you know, uh, this is true of Republicans and Democrats. I was, uh, you know, I started editing Reason. I've been working at Reason since 93. I started, uh, I became editor-in-chief of the magazine in 2000, and, you know, I can't think of a good thing, um, you know, really, that I wrote about George W. Bush for the most part. Um, you know, he, you know, it's, it's liberals and, and conservatives in government, Republicans and Democrats, we've just had, you know, Trump himself. I am not an anti-Trumper, but I'm also not a pro-Trumper, but he... Even before COVID, he massively increased the size, scope, and spending of government. And then he was really bad during COVID. You know, for whatever he's saying now, he's the guy who pushed 
the, the national lockdown. He was the one who mainstreamed the idea of uh, two weeks to flatten the curve and things like that. So everybody, there's a lot of blood or, you know, at least mud on people's hands. And, and that's a super important issue. I think what's important, though, is that we also consider the ways in which we either can change that or how do we, how do we get people to come over to our side of the aisle or, or to kind of think about libertarian ways of dismantling, you know, a large and growing state. Um, and I don't know that, you know, maybe, I mean, you might do it more through, uh, you know, kind of pessimism and kind of millenarian claims that like, if we don't stop this, you know, right now it's all over, baby blue. Um, I don't disagree with that. Like the time to end the entitlement state was, you know, five years ago, if not 50 years ago, or, you know, in 1935 when it kind of got cranked up in its, in its current form. Um, but, you know, th that has always been the case. Government has almost always been growing at every level through our entire lifetime. So it's not new. Something like a presidential kill list. I remember when that came out, and I, was, I wrote you know, voluminously about it because I think this was the thing to stick in the eye of people who were saying, well, George W. Bush was terrible, but Barack Obama was this enlightened liberal and, uh, you know, and he, he defended you know, civil liberties and things like that. Was, that was just total horseshit. Um, I had the uh, opportunity and the honor, really, to interview Edward Snowden, you know, who, was, it, who was absolutely essential in bringing this kind of hypocrisy to light. Uh, Snowden also, you know, this was in 2016, I did it uh, through the Free State Project. He acknowledged that he thought this was, you know, that the individual had more freedom now. He was calling in from Russia and he said, the individual has more ability now to make their lives the way they want to than ever before. And I think, you know, I think he meant it. I think he knows what he's talking about in this case. And I think it's still true, which isn't to say that it's perfect. Kill list presidents have always had kill lists. Um, and, you know, when you look at the history of the 70s, what the church committee or, or the church commission, I guess, church committee, uh, as well as the Rockefeller Commission unearthed, you know, about what the NSA was doing, what the CIA was doing, what the FBI is doing. It was terrible. That gave rise to, you know, the FISA courts and other things now, which have become complete rubber stamps for the surveillance state. But the, my point is, you know, presidents have always, this kind of thing has always been there. Um, and it doesn't mean that we put up with it and we tolerate it. It's that we unmask it and we try to reduce it and try to get rid of it all the time. But it's not new. Um, when you talk about things like, you know, race relations in America are, um, you know, they're, they're not great. But I don't think there is, to be honest, I don't think there's any comparison to what was going on through, you know, certainly through uh, the mid-60s in terms of de jure segregation that was in place, you know, and things are not good now and they need to get better and we need to get away from identity politics and more to an individualist cause. But, you know, I'm a heterosexual white male. My, I have two sons, both heterosexual white males, and it's not, you know, they are a punching bag or we are a punching bag. Cisgender, heterosexual white males in many ways are punching bags in the culture, but I don't think we have it, um, you know, in bad in a way that it is enough to say, okay, you know what, like the world is a dark place now. Um, you and I, my kids, I think a lot of people like us are doing extremely well. And, you know, it is the work of improving society and especially putting forth libertarian ideas where you reduce the ability of governments or other forces to coerce you and you increase the sphere of individual autonomy, that is always a fight. It's always a tough slog. But, you know, I think we're in, I think we're in very good shape, you know, um, and so I, I guess I'll stop yapping for now there. Okay, so, I mean, it's, I think what's going to end up happening with this is you and I yeah. are going to say things that we largely agree, like with this statement of this is, here's a, a, a statement about the world and I don't think we're going to say like, no, I think that's just, you're not, that you're yeah. wrong. <laughs> but okay, like, well, that, but then yeah, our, okay. our, our turn, you know, our, yeah. our conclusion. So can I, then let me, yeah. let me throw something out there because I think this was part of, uh, you know, the, the uh, back and forth that we got into Twitter because I had posted a clip from that students for Liberty thing. And then you were like, wow, you know, I, you know, when I just had come out of a, a Bible study, oh, yeah. I was talking to mm -hmm. you know, and my, you know, the people I'm there with are like, are you kidding? This is like we are a couple of minutes away from, you know, the USSR of America, you know, like that we're in a terrible place and things like that. I, um, 
I don't, you know, I think cultural pessimism or pessimism in general is not particularly warranted at this point in time. Like, I actually, when I look at a variety of things that are specific to libertarians, criti libertarian critiques of state power, there are a lot of things that are happening that are good. It is extremely meaningful that the war on drugs is being dismantled. It is taking way too long and it's too slow, but because when you tug on the string, you know, that the, the drug war is on, it, it gets rid of a lot of stuff that you're talking about, including, you know, racial classifications, but about police powers, about uh, incarcerating people, about regulating everyday life and, you know, people being able on a most basic level to change their minds the way that they want to. We're in the beginning of that. This is, you know, like I said, I've been at Reason now 30, 31 years. Um, when I joined the staff, I knew that the drug war would end and certainly the war on marijuana would end. I didn't know how and I didn't know when, but it's starting. And that's a good thing. That's a win for human freedom. And more to the point, I, I don't smoke weed. I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't uh, drink. I don't do a lot of drugs. So it's not like this stuff, you know, is like, oh, now I can get legal weed. But it it is the beginning of the end. It's a, It's a shift in mindset towards more freedom for individuals to live how they want. I think that's also true in terms of foreign policy. And unfortunately, in the 21st century, you know, we had to go through the uh, inane stupidity of the war on terror, you know, that was uh, instituted and kind of misarticulated by George W. Bush, but then, you know, followed up on, you know, certainly by Obama. Um, but, you know, Americans now are more skeptical of foreign intervention than they have been in my lifetime. Um, you know, and I think that's a good thing. I, uh, you know, we're, we're going after things like occupational licensing. We're going after things like zoning uh, in a way that is really important and was unthinkable, you know, even 10 years ago, I think. So for me, there's a lot of green shoots out there. Um, and this, you know, the question is how do, we, how do we get to a world where, you know, people have more space and more freedom to, to do what they want to do? Okay, uh, so I guess the elephant in the room would be the COVID lockdowns. Yeah. And, you know, so there it's in terms of like to say I, I, I disagree <laughs> that people in, the, in our age are more free yeah. to do what they want to do. I mean, that was so I, I agree marijuana legalization happened faster. And particularly it was happening when I lived in Tennessee. I was talking with some of the mm -hmm. people there that were, you know, they had me coming as a speaker and like the, the normal group yeah. and then some other groups that were you know, trying different strategies. And I was su surprised at how receptive even the Tennessee legislators were to that. I just had assumed, oh, yeah, it's not going to, you know, happen in California and, you know, up uh, New England states. But but I, w I was surprised there, uh, certainly, like, especially coming like the medicinal angle, they were mm -hmm. surprisingly open to that. But on the other hand, if you had told me that, yeah, that it's just going to be that your governor can tell you whether you're allowed to go to church or not yeah, on, on no, Easter. Yeah. yeah. And if you could have people come over to your house or not, yeah. or your parents are dying in the hospital and you can't go see them, that would have been inconceivable to me too. Yeah. Uh, unless it was like, you know, a zombie apocalypse movie and people were literally yeah. like pi 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 piling up at the streets, which we were told was going to happen in the beginning and then didn't right. actually happen. So right. anyway, I'm just saying like, it's, Oh no. And I, yeah. you know, I live mm -hmm. in New York city, which is in mm -hmm. New York state where, you know, we had such luminaries as Andrew Cuomo on a weekly basis, deciding which businesses he considered, you know, essential or non-essential. And, you know, uh, who knows what that guy was come, you know, what was his decision matrix, you know, cause that was one of the things when Obama's kill list came out, people started talking about, Oh, the, decision matrix of mm -hmm. Obama. Like, would you kill people? Andrew Cuomo would be like, okay, well, you know, you can have this or that. You know, it got to a point where he was saying like, okay, well, bars can be open, but, uh, you know, they have to serve substantive food. And mm -hmm. it couldn't just be like guacamole and chips wasn't enough, but was maybe a burrito, you mm -hmm. know, or a quesadilla with guacamole. Okay, yeah, maybe. And like, what kind of world are we living in where you have to you know, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, go to the king and ask permission to just go about your business, especially if there is a health, uh, health emergency, then you create the protocol, which you say like, okay, if you follow this protocol, you're open for business or you're not. It's not the rule of the state to say, well, you know what, we don't like what you're selling. So you can't, you can't open, but over here you can. Um, so, you know, the COVID 
the COVID lockdowns, uh, which I push back on, you know, often and loudly from the beginning all the way through. I like vaccines and I don't like vaccine mandates. You know, mm -hmm. I, you know, we can roam all around that. It was horrible. And one of the things that we can do, I mean, if we agree that it was a unbelievable and almost inconceivable overstep and overreach of the government, now how do we make sure that people remember what happened so that if that gets tried again, it gets slapped down quicker? Um, and again, this, this isn't much of a debate because we basically right. agree with all of that. Um, but... You know, this is, to me, um, it's it's kind of a question of attitude, and I'm not sure that it's libertarian per se, or it's not like, you know, we, we obviously, you know, we belong to different factions with, within the broader libertarian mm -hmm. universe and things like that. But I think in a lot of ways, what we might be talking about uh, or what where we might be disagreeing has more to do with kind of personality or... Um, you know, kind of attitudes towards things. Um, I tend to see things, and again, as you know, and I, I will put it out there, this is mostly uh, from a personal history level. I grew up, uh, my parents grew up very poor. I grew up lower middle class. My kids grew up upper middle class. I see that as progress, and I understand, you know, one of the reasons I'm, I'm a libertarian and why I'm a capitalist is because I firmly believe, I think I know, and I want to say from personal experience, but personal experience can be uh, tricky, um, and certainly you don't argue just from personal experience that like capitalism and the, you know, the freedom that comes with free minds and free markets, you know, that is the best system for allowing people to rise according to their work efforts and to their ambition and to their abilities and things like that. But I, you know, I see the world, generally speaking, getting better. I don't see it getting worse um, in toto. Uh, and in any case, you know, what, what are we going to do with our lives? Like, you know, if, if it's that bad, um, you know, and if it keeps getting worse, Bob, I don't, why, why do you show up for work every day? Well, uh, well, cause I'm a Christian. And so I think yeah. I'm supposed okay. to go ahead and, and keep it, keep my chin up. So I, I think partly it's, um, I think we, you and I probably do have a fundamental disagreement about where we think things are going to be five years from now, let's say. Mm -hmm. So are, do you disagree with my assessment that the U.S. had a global empire that is collapsing? Do you think that's not I, correct? Yeah, here, I'll put it in slightly different terms and also in optimistic terms. Mm -hmm. the, the, the hegemonic power that the United States both kind of exercised and more importantly thought it could exercise but did poorly mm -hmm. during much of the Cold War and much of the period in the night, like post-Cold War, um, you know, the U.S. thought it was in control of things. It thought it was the indispensable nation, et cetera. Yes, I think the United States no longer has the power that it might have once had, and it always overestimated its power to do mm -hmm. this. Um, you know, and think of places like Vietnam and things like that. We thought we could go in and shape world history, and we could we could dictate local disputes and local developments and things like that. That was always kind of arrogance and hubris on our part. Sometimes it worked, especially if we did it through trade and diplomacy or cultural exchange, rather through military might or, or kind of economic coercion. Um, we are in a different world now. And I think one of the things that the U.S., like I don't, I don't, uh, I don't bemoan or I, I, I don't miss the idea of an American empire. Um, I think America is still, you know, it's, it's, we are the largest economy on the planet. I think we are the best country, um, especially if we learn how to kind of, um, you know, redo our immigration policy so that we're being, bringing people who are, you know, really uh, motivated and ambitious and smart and want to either work and live in the U.S. or do business with the U.S. If we can fix that, and this is a major problem, uh, I think, and in many ways, it might have gotten worse over the past 20 years. I don't know. That might be a place where I think we're doing poorly. But the U.S. has less ability to dictate terms around the, around the globe. I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing unless America keeps insisting that we not only have the ability to do that, but we have some kind of moral right. And so, you know, if we go back into countries like we did in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, that is really bad. It's not only going to deplete our resources, but it's going to make the world a much, much worse place. Um, I look forward to living in an America and working 
to build a consensus to say, you know what, America is not the indispensable nation. America is not the world's policeman. Um, and that when we learn that we are a country, a great country, but one among many, and that it's better to use suasion and markets and you know open and equal exchange rather than military force to get our way. I think we'll, be, we'll not only have a better country, but we'll have a better world as well. Yeah, so just to be clear, I'm not lamenting the fall of the U.S. empire. I, yeah. I just want to make sure we agree, like, on a macro view of what's, you know, c c in store globally. I, I think, I, I don't think, you know, I, I think about this a lot. And I, you know, I think one of the places where broadly we probably agree about most things related to the Federal Reserve or a national currency, but, you know, in a way that we might think differently about it is, I think it is less, you know, countries now have less ability than they have almost ever had to either inflate or deflate their currency because markets are so linked, even the U.S. dollar. Um, you know, the U.S. has less control over world currency than it ever did. And this isn't even counting in something like Bitcoin, which I see as a massive win for, you know, a stateless, stateless currency or a kind of hedge or a check on the ability of national currencies to just kind of do whatever they want with their money. Um, you know, I think countries, you know, national banks have less power than they had in mid 20th century. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I agree that they have less, I guess my concern is, I think the US government is gonna be acting like a cornered animal over the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah. And, you know, and, and maybe a, a cornered animal that's weak and has been partially clawed or something, but still you don't yeah, want to be yeah. locked in a room with it. So I agree. It's good for the world at large, but I, that's partly why I'm so pessimistic about what is life going to be like for the average American over the next five to 10 years is I think. Yeah, I, I hear you on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you know, I think about that in terms of, uh, you know, the lunatic fantasies of control of, you know, economic, cultural, uh, political control, like when somebody like Elizabeth Warren, who is your senator, right? You're in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, and when she, uh, was it a year ago when she started talking about how like, you know, there's too many different plugs for electric appliances or computer appliances, like all of them should be standardized. You know, one way of looking at that is to say like, this is an insane person who, you know, is living in a in a, her own dream world. Like what the, what is wrong with her? Um, you know, and it's dangerous because she can start passing laws that make this harder and harder and that's, you know, to just innovate, which is why you have a lot of different plugs and things like that. Another way of thinking about it is like it is over for people like that in a profound way. Um, and I think our job within the broad, again, the broad kind of Catholic libertarian movement is to kind of, you know, call out these people and mock them, but also to show you know, do the math for why those kinds of fantasies of regulation are doomed to failure. We've gone through all of this before. I am worried, you know, the only thing that worries me more than another Trump presidency in many ways is another Biden presidency. And I think, you know, one of the things where um, I, I don't really get into partisan politics too much, but, I, you know, in 2016, I was happy that Trump beat Hillary. I kind of wanted Trump to beat uh, uh, Biden in 2020, not because I like Trump, but I think the broad dynamics that would have been put into place would have been better for individual freedom. Um, but, you know, when you look at somebody like Biden, you know, who may win and be in power for the next four or five years, um, you know, every moment that he has, any dial he can find on kind of the economy, he's trying to turn it down a little bit, right? Like he, he wants to control more and more things. When you look at his SEC or his FTC, they're insane and they're, they're playing out an, a mid 20th century playbook where, you know, the best and the brightest run big corporations and, and are beyond market forces. And the best and the brightest are running uh, government bureaucracies that tell businesses how to split their markets up and things like that. It's bad. And, and we need to sadly re, re kind of relitigate or refight a lot of battles that I thought were settled 20 or 30 years ago. Okay, so just even on that point, though, isn't that another sign, like to me in terms of just saying, whoa, this country is really screwed up now, is just yeah. how openly, and that's why I harped on the, the civil fraud suit or, or mm -hmm. whatever, verdict against Trump, is because to me, it's just so clear, this is all, they're just throwing everything they can at this guy because they don't want him to be president again. Sure. 
and yeah. everybody's going along with it because they just don't like them. And it, yeah, whether I, you like Trump good. or not, like that's not a good. Yeah. like that's yeah, kind of banana prosec republic prosecutory, stuff. I, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, it's prosecutorial mis uh, abuse or misconduct is not anything new again, though. And what what we're seeing, and this to me. Um, you know, I live and well, die by creative What do you mean you say it's nothing new? Like, you don't think this is qualitatively different? I mean, I guess if you think the no, CIA I, I, killed Kennedy, yeah. which no, I, you know, I, I do. which I don't. Okay, yeah, I but do I do. not. <laughs> so okay. yeah, in yeah, a I sense, know. I get like, no, I, if the know, deep state doesn't I, uh, like you, but put that aside. Yeah. I'm just, this is this is out no, in the open. What, That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but what what I'm saying is is that like um, you know talking about what happens to Donald Trump, and I'm not saying you know I I don't I think this is a nuisance lawsuit, and I think it will probably get overturned on some level. Uh, and, you know, people are, are weaponizing all sorts of stuff to get him. Mm -hmm. OK, there's no question about that. But that is not necessarily something that is going to affect most people or the average person. What I'm looking at when I look at the bigger picture and, you know, and again, I say this to somebody who moved back to New York. I was born in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, raised in New Jersey, lived here uh, before I went to grad school, et cetera. You know, but I came back to New York City the most overregulated place in the world and also, you know, weirdly, I think the best city or the city I want to live in at this point in my life. Um, but people are leaving New York and California, you know, the, of the four most populous states, we're seeing something play out in real time, which is pretty fascinating, where you have in California and New York very clear models of a growing government, you know, that has always been too big, but is now reach the point where they are, you know, they're smothering their economies, they're smothering many aspects of the life. I think New York City um, is, you know, the, the city is too vibrant. So it keeps punching through whatever, you know, weighted anxiety blanket gets thrown on it by uh, people. But people are leaving for places like Texas and Florida, you know, which are the, you know, two of the four most populous states. And we're seeing an experimentation in governance, you know, which is New and exciting. And I, I'm not all in on, you know, either Greg Abbott or Ron DeSantis or those states, but like, I think it's pretty good. We, we, I guess another way of thinking about this, Bob, is I believe like we're, we're at the end of an epoch, right? So in a way like you, I'm kind of millenarian. We're at the end of something. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the 20th century, the long 20th century is coming to a close finally. It should have ended at least 20 years ago, 25 years ago, but it didn't. But the, the methods, the models, the mindsets, the temperaments, the institutions that arose in mid 20th century America, which were mostly built on a kind of command and control model. You know, this was the best and the brightest. Like we just get the smartest people to run every business and, you know, the businesses get really big and then they don't have to worry about market forces. We get a government that's bigger and bigger and full of smart people with a lot of degrees and preferably from Ivy League schools or whatever, you know, and they run everything because we, we figured it out. Like we're not dummies anymore. That 20th century model was breaking down, you know, it started breaking down in the 50, even as it began in the 50s and 60s, certainly in the 70s. Um, and I think we're finally coming to politics and we're, we're finally breaking that down. Um, and it's not going to be pretty. You may be right. There's going to be a lot of dark years and it's going to be dark for places. You know, we're in, the, we're in the old part of the country, right? You know, Massachusetts was the first site of the Industrial Revolution. It was, you know, it was the first rich, super rich state. New York was one of the first rich states. We're in a bad place for this. Um, but there's rebirth going on and there's shifts coming around. And I think a 21st century, a model that is very individualistic, that is more decentralized, you know, that follows from the internet and from Bitcoin and from, you know, the insights of, uh, you know, many of the people that we find, you know, to be prescient and insightful thinkers. This is the world that is starting to come online. Um, and I'm very excited to see that, even if the end of anything is going to be messy. I think it's great that we got out of Afghanistan. It was a very messy departure, but it was probably always going to be messy. Um, and it may be that in the next few years, we see a messy departure from what I call the long 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be messy, but it's got to happen. Okay, we got just about seven minutes or so before I got to do okay. a hard stop. So let me, th this is going to be a little bit of an exaggeration, but I, I feel yeah. like, again, we're we agree on the particulars and it's just the way we summarize. So this is going to be admittedly an exaggeration, but consider sure. the world depicted in the first matrix movie, right? Okay. So I could be a pessimist and say, 
holy cow, like the machines have enslaved humanity. The vast majority of people are plugged in to this virtual reality thing where they don't even know they're slaves and they're just serving their cogs in the machine and whatever, and they're just being distracted by this. And, but then, you know, a, an optimist could come on and say, are you talking? Look at, look at Morpheus's ship. That's cool. There's nothing like that yeah. now. We can't fly around. That's awesome. And look, look at how much at freedom one, they how have. How are we communicating? I mean, like we're communicating <laughs> in space age stuff. You no. know, Dick Tracy was R dreaming right. of this. But, but I mean, you're, you're underscoring my point. Right. So I'm just saying that you, you get there that like those two things could be true. So yeah. I'm saying I think that's what we're doing. Like I'm talking about it looks like the police surveillance state, uh, you know, mass surveillance, just hurting people like 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 the ability to control yeah. the masses like cattle and whatever that that yeah. those tools like. So, yes, the, they were always had kill lists, but they didn't have drones they could just send out. And so now that that's like been normalized, I think you're going to see more drone survey. And then, you know, 10 years from now, I think it's going to be quite easy that everybody just knows, yeah, you don't yeah. want to speak out too much because a drone will come and you won't be seen again. You I know. don't, yeah. I mean, you know, look, that's, you know, that's a plausible anxiety or a plausible mm -hmm. fear, right? Um, I would argue that even in a place like China, which is probably, you know, the, you know, that's what a lot of people point to is like, okay, that's one direction that we could be going in. It's better to be alive in China now than it was probably in any time in the past 500 years of Chinese history. And I guarantee, or this is a bet that we can mm -hmm. have in 10 years, China is going to be more liberal. Um, or it's going to have seen a mass exodus of people, even you know from something approaching a prison camp, uh, because that is that's the way the world works. And even within China, with the surveillance and everything, with industrialization and the growth of mega cities, I guarantee you that people have more individual freedom there uh, than they had, because you you have to look at each place you know based on its own history. And like you know, in in the late '60s. You know, people didn't have freedom in China uh, mm -hmm. and things like that. But more importantly, in the U.S., and I think more broadly in the world, what and, – and this – you know, part of this is taste preference. Like, I don't think this is something where we can say, okay, somebody's right or wrong. But I would argue that what has happened in the United States is um, the ability of people to dictate what is a good and meaningful life has shrunk. Um, when you think about it, the government can't do that the way that it maybe it did. Schools can't do that. Families can't do that. Religions can't do that. Corporations can't do that. They are all, they have more limited power, even if the government has more reach. And as a result, what it means is that we're competing, like we need, we have made a mass phenomenon out of existential angst because we're, we're, we're at a higher level of uh, economic and material resources. So we're way up Has Maslow's hierarchy. Um, and what that means is that each of us has to create meaning on a daily basis and then recreate it and keep it going. And that is a daunting task. And I don't think that Americans are have been particularly acculturated into that or educated for that. And I think that's where a lot of the despair comes from. And I think that's where a lot of the polarization comes from, which I don't necessarily say is a bad thing. Like what I want in America, I want as many people to be running as many experiments and living as they can come up with, as long as it's peaceful and as long as it's not coercive, um, you know, it's all to the good. And we are, this is another sign that the world in which you and I were born into is dying. And that's generally, you know, it's both a sad thing because there were many good things about that world, but it's also a good thing because it means that something new is being born. And I think that new thing is going to be more individualistic. I think it is going to, it'll, it'll, you know, we live in a world where people can express themselves more than in the past. It's actually more people are expressing dissent and, and difference from the, you know, whatever the, uh, uh, you know, the, the conventional wisdom is or the status quo is than ever before. How can that be bad? Okay, let me put give one pushback, and then I'll give you the final word, yeah. and we'll wrap up here. And because I also think this is going to be one where we do, we just we're coming from radically different places. Yeah, I don't. I think there are certain subsets of Americans that younger people, where there is a very real sense in which they are not as free as their counterparts would have been twenty years ago. So, uh. girls 
in the locker rooms and schools mm-hmm. and, you know, having bought with who they think are boys coming in and changing from stuff yeah. like that. They're not allowed to complain against that or they're going to be labeled transphobes mm-hmm. uh, and they're interested or more generally students since it's certain college campuses. Yeah. You know, if a speaker comes in, they don't like, no, they're allowed to shout that guy down and threaten violence. And that, you know, so I, yeah. I don't think the sphere of individual autonomy has actually grown or at least it's only defined in a certain way and i think there's other corresponding things where it's a it's a negative sure. zero-sum game Here. so all I'll, right so yeah, you, get, well, the, you get where i'm coming from so what do you yeah no yeah. no no i mean mm-hmm. like it is harder to enforce uh you know it, it's harder to enforce a cultural orthodoxy i think now because you know people can say like okay well i'm a you know, I'm a, a, a heterosexual male Christian, and I'm not allowed to object to something in my public school. It's like, you know, there may be something true to that, but it's also true that like 20 or 50 years ago, there were other orthodoxies that if you weren't a heterosexual white Christian male, you weren't allowed. You, you didn't have a voice. When it comes to college campuses, I think what is going on, uh, we've seen a breaking point, And this is something like a fever has to break. Colleges that absolutely are prone to violence and to shouting down people rather than engaging in, you know, in reasoned debate, which is the whole purpose of a university, are going to lose market share. I, you know, we saw recently Harvard announced that its applications were way down, not simply because of the response to, uh, you know, the objective embrace of Hamas, of terrorists by large numbers of people on the uh, Harvard campus. It goes back years before that. I interviewed Steven Pinker recently, and he said, you know, before October 7th, Harvard Harvard had become a joke. Um, that's and applications are down at like the oldest and most prestigious university in America. That's good news, you know. And people are pushing back against this stuff. I think the solution to particular questions like trans stuff, because I think it's really important that you know people who are trans and you know kids. It's always a much more complicated issue than with wh- whatever arbitrary age we assign to majority or adulthood. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's it's really important to, you know, that people can express themselves and become who they want to be. Again, not at the expense of other people, but one of the things that we're seeing in public schools, which are atrocious and are minimum security prisons, right, you know, for the most part, K through 12 schools, is we are seeing a breakdown of the old traditional kind of factory model of education. More people are leaving public schools. They're just, they're, they're not even doing necessarily homeschooling or going to private schools. They're just doing what they want. These are things you know, these are inheritances of the mid 20th century model, that long 20th century that are breaking down. Um, so it's not perfect in all cases and things like that. But I think the trend lines are going towards a world of permissionless innovation and of more decentralized power and living. We have the technology that enables that. We have the wealth that enables that. And what we need to do is create a political movement that really supercharges this so that the next five years aren't terrible, but, you know, they're actually pretty good. Okay, well, great. And I actually, in my other capacity, in my day job, Nick, I we are building those tools to try to help people. <laughs> so yeah. I, you're right, it's ne- never a cause for despair, but it's, it's uh, do have a different perspective for you. So folks, my guest has been Nick Gillespie. Nick, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks everybody for tuning in. And I guess time will tell which of these perspectives is more accurate. I I hope you're right, Nick. I hope so, too. (laughs) Okay. You know. Thanks, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.